the plot thickens. Top scientists and organizations are changing the game. The news won't report any of it. The journals are caught in the middle, in the wake of a tsunami of studies on solar plasma climate forcing. We've shown the particle dominance in the energy delivery, their paths to the atmosphere, and the effects on the vortex and jet streams. Now, it's time for the oceans. This part four has two parts itself, the review of one of the most robust and recognized solar force and correlations, and the introduction to how the Earth has hidden the solar effect, and a man who may be ready with the right idea at the right time. We begin with ENSO, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, El Nino and La Nina. This is one of the most studied and most verified solar forcing manifestations, and this one was actually recognized well before the recent shift to allow solar particle forcing into the game, but yet it still lacks a place in the models. By the way, there are more citations listed in this video here in case you are the pause, jot down, and dig deeper type. It is a direct correlation. High solar activity pushes ENSO positive towards El Nino, while low solar activity pushes ENSO negative towards La Nina. It's not so dominant that it overtakes the natural cycle, but if we were supposed to have an El Nino, high solar activity would intensify it. If it was supposed to be a La Nina cycle, then sunspot minimum periods would intensify that. They are noticing that both two and 10 year lags in the forcing exist, and this is actually a very common lag period when it comes to the solar forcing of the terrestrial climate. While some particle forcing does manifest within minutes, others have lag times of up to 20 or 30 years. This just means that the oceans are taking in the heat and holding onto it or pushing it deeper to where it slowly can bleed back out into the atmosphere. Now when it comes to how the sun injects that energy into the oceans, the pathways are the ones we already know. First, it's the cloud cover and sunlight exposure factor. Sunspot minimum, with more cosmic rays and more clouds, allows less light into the oceans, while solar maximum has the opposite effect, plus a tiny bit more ultraviolet light on those sunny days. Now think about how far down into the ocean you'd have to go before the water is pitch black. Everything above there is taking in sunlight, directly transforming it to heat and cycling it around in the oceans. That's before you ever consider the particle forcing. And then we have to also consider those large scale circulations that we looked at in part three, when the Hadley and Walker cells take in not only more sunlight from the lower cloud cover and sunspot maximum, but the majority of the particle forcing from CME impacts as well. They present one of the key drivers of not only how much energy can go into the oceans, but how much can come back out. Now, when it comes to the studies of the sun and direct effects on sea surface temperature, they are very numerous, but show only a small effect in real time. The process doesn't really seem to kick in for one to three years later, with cycle modulation rather than intensity modulation on the decadal scale. We have seen studies of deep ocean temperature relatively well confirmed that the deep ocean lag can stretch to that 20 or 30 years, which, by the way, is everything you need to explain why the global warming pause started almost a decade after the peak solar flux to Earth, and why Earth won't really start to cool down until a few years after the grand minimum begins later this century. But what if you could stretch these lag periods to say 75 or 85 years? That's when you start to see CO2 dropping below the relevance mark almost altogether. For studies of this length, you can't go with climate scientists. You need someone focused not on the atmosphere, but on the broader scope of geophysics. I've got a list of some scary outcome and solar forcing research by a Roger Higgs, PhD, sedimentology, Oxford. For those Americans who don't know, it's consistently in the top five of the world. It took about two minutes of me checking into the sky to find the sort of writing indicative of master level understanding, telling the difference between long period accumulation and rapid deposition in sediments is not easy. And furthermore, when someone lists their rejected papers alongside their accepted ones, there's a lot to be said for the character there. I could challenge you to go find many professors' pages that meet that standard, and you will fail that challenge. 
So his listings are under an umbrella project that addresses a massive, non-human cause, sea level surge ongoing, and to do so he must first demonstrate the real long-term driver of climate change. There would be no way for me to go over all of his slides and conclusions, but they can be described as a nearly overkill proof that the sun not only has that 20-year lag effect in the oceans, which he clearly identifies, but also a much longer 75 to 85-year lag. Heat is quickly circulated into the depths of the water, but there it can continue to circulate or disperse and wait to present itself at the atmosphere once again. He also demonstrates that before the Industrial Revolution, an increase in CO2, plants were rapidly approaching their starvation point in the atmosphere. This is a point that was made by other scientists, one in a presentation you may have heard called a dearth of carbon. We are actually approaching, but not yet arrived at, the optimum level of CO2 for plants, the level where all great life explosions in Earth's history have taken place. He touches on a point that we have made many times, that the grand solar maximum of the last century is the real cause of global warming. He correctly identifies it as the strongest of the last thousand years, and observers, you should remember that Usoskin has pretty convincingly showed it's likely the strongest in 12,000 years. About the only thing I could ever disagree with is the potential time frame for Higgs cooling, which he says is still decades away with the 85-year lag after grand solar maximum. But the slow heating is a little different than Svensmark's cosmic ray and cloud processes. The atmosphere reacts much more quickly, and those don't need much time at all. The key point here, of course, is that the oceans are indeed a thermal trap, and they forbid nice and easy real-time correlations between solar activity and the temperature of the atmosphere. The 20-year lag from the oceans means we are still seeing the heat from the grand solar maximum today right now, and I do have to say, this longer cycle has a lot of evidence and may be the last piece of the puzzle in explaining the recent warmer atmosphere of the planet. Now one of Roger's best pieces in the project turned out to be a bit of an assault to read on the phone, so I've copied it into a public Word document for you. This is his work, I'm merely reposting it here with a link to the original. The 27 points in the short work offer many more talking points, questions, and doubts on the story we've all been fed for so long. Folks, as you can see, even with the much greater particle forcing now allowed into the game after 40 years of climate science stiff-arming astrophysics, there are still so many subtleties, nuances, and long-term modulations of the effects we see. The sun's energy has a few paths to the atmosphere, but once it gets there, it's got a smorgasbord of choices and pathways and hiding spots and circulations, and it chooses them all. So to review... There have been enough irradiance correlations with climate, ignored, to create the question that has plagued climate science for decades. The particle forcing now allows the rest of the major energy budget to be reconciled, while the oceans mask the correlations and lag its effects over many years. In part 5, we will be getting into the other side of this scale, the more immediate effects of solar activity, and that's when things actually get terrifying, not only for those who are affected, but for those who have spent their lives taking our money to deliver a biased conclusion based on a half-truth. Be safe, everyone.